You ready? Watch out. Help me. Did that scare the shit out of you? Well, hello, hello, everyone. Sorry, my stream labs. Well, hello, hello, everyone. Sorry, oh, and my then this is on. Stream. I'm just starting out wonderfully today. <laughs> Sorry about that. My um, stream labs crashed. And I was like, well, shit, I just took a whole bottle of VIX 44. <laughs> so I'm a little laggy. Can everybody hear me? Put a one in the chat if you can. Hello, Earth. Good to see you. Julia T. Can anyone hear me in the chat? Put a one if you can. Okay, good deal. I see Julia said one. Thank you, Julia. <clears throat> so I have a cold slash flu, whichever. They both suck. So I'm just going to roll them into one. And my little one has the same thing. So of course, since I've been around him and he's been around me, that's how it works. So I will be a little like laggy. I apologize, but I'm still going to do my thing. All right. So we're going to talk about Karen Reed trial today because I feel that it's very important to cover cases where, oh, thank you, Julia. I feel that it is, it is important to cover cases in which local um, citizens not only have a right to speak out on some of the issues that have happened in relation to uh, law enforcement who de who seems to have a past with bullying, you know, harassing, intimidation, and all of those things. Uh, this is Massachusetts, okay? This is Boston. And there has been uh, many, many claims over the years of corruption. I mean, there's movies about it, for Christ's sakes, and I know that it's movies and it's Hollywood. However, there is always um, truth. Art imitates uh, life, right? Yeah, you are at the Cub Scout thing, doing your thing. Thank you for giving me the time to do this live. I appreciate you, Mr. Eve. So anytime that locals get involved with a case or someone who is from the same area that covers it and exposes people in authority or positions of authority who abuse it, I like to get into those cases because it has happened in my own family um, tragedy and so I get it. And I think it's important to put those things out there. Now, there are a lot of creators who cover the Karen Reed case. Um, and again, I don't cover it in detail. I like to be on the Twitter uh, side of it because, I mean, they, they already have it. The glare has it, um, a grab on it. Turtle Boy, of course, Aiden Kearney, who was uh, charged with witness intimidation, uh, nine felony counts, I believe, and other things. So they have this. They got it in the bag. I am just a girl from Texas who enjoys looking at this case from all angles. However, this this uh, most recent update <laughs> where we kind of get to see where the defense is coming into play as to why Karen Reed is innocent and the third party uh, culprit defense, which is very rare. It's very rare to see those things, but when they do come out, typically it's for a good reason. Again, very rare circumstances. Not that I ever doubted that, but in this case, because there's just so many red flags with the entire investigation that happened on this case, but 
the intertwining of people who knew each other, family members, family, friends, people grew up together. And here's the biggest thing that people neglect, I think, to, to focus on besides um, Turtle Boy and other creators that cover this more than, than anyone else. Alcohol. Alcohol is the biggest factor, in, in my opinion, as to why things are going on in these people's lives that are enhancing or influencing decision making and the drama. And not only that, but people who are corrupt in authoritative figures are exploiting that to get away with it. Right. And they have done it for a very long time. So we're going to get into not, not the nitty gritty that has been rehashed over and over. If you, if you're not familiar with it, you got to go do your homework (laughs) because we don't have that kind of time. However, um, this is kind of where I'm going to start at the, at the time in like 2023, when it became aware to people that there was a relationship, an entanglement, a romantic entanglement with someone that was within the home, which John O'Keefe was found outside, uh, in a snowbank. Now, John O'Keefe was a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, and people looked up to him. You know, he was a very important um, community man, right? But he also had, just like everybody else in the world, issues in life, relationships, whatever. And one of the things that came out early was that John O'Keefe was having issues with Colin Albert, who at the time I believe was a minor when this all went down. Now, Colin Albert is the nephew of the Boston PD, Brian Albert, the home that uh, John O'Keefe was going into and did go into that home. Karen dropped him off, never came back, and she got mad and went home. All right. Now, at the very beginning, they were like, oh, you know, they had a thick blizzard and winds were gusting and everything like that, in which we know that that wasn't necessarily the case at the time. However, it was horrible weather. Right. And we all know about the Lucky Lofren, the uh, snowplower who said that he did not see John O'Keefe at 2.30 in the morning, 3 in the morning. But there was a forward edge there. We've all gone over that. But we're going to start at the fact that we all know the details. And we're going to talk about a man named Brian Higgins. He was a person who was at the home, at the residence of Brian Albert, fellow PD. And he had an entanglement with Karen Reed. An entanglement. I believe that it was exploited. I do because the Commonwealth, which is the prosecutor's office of Massachusetts in Norfolk County, gave this information way late into the game in response to the defense's motion to dismiss. So I'm going to have um, Vinnie Paulison from Court TV explain it way better than I could since I am so under the weather today. So let's get after it. And I'm sure Mr. Eve is <clears throat> tired of me talking about this when I find something out. I'm like, guess what, Mr. Eve? Da 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 da. And he's like, I'm, you lost me. Because <laughs> I talk about Michael Vaughn's case so much. So, all right, let's play. That's Morrissey. That is um, District Attorney Michael Morrissey. And he did something very unprecedented. He came out swinging, saying, Colin Albert was not in the house and blah, blah, blah. It's going to take weeks to see the jury. I know. I'm really worried about trials starting on time. Um, But you know what? I'm not worried about anything, honestly, because in my opinion only, I'm I'm not trying to sway my audience here, but in my opinion only, Karen Reed is 100% innocent. And that is my basis on the channel. You don't have to like it. Uh, There is a possibility that she uh, may 
be involved in some way, but that's for the jury to decide. I just feel like that she is innocent and she is being framed based on what I've seen over time. I mean, I could go on and on and on to give you all examples, but they're out there already. So he comes out swinging. I have never heard of a prosecuting attorney, a district attorney come out and say this person and that person wasn't involved when they didn't do their due diligence and the investigation blew from the moment it started. Okay. There was a reason that they, he came out to do this because he had special interests. Otherwise, why would his uh, office be under federal investigation in regards to uh, the murder of John O'Keefe and the investigation that was taking place? So now, like I said, the defense has been very aggressive in all of this. They have a theory about what happened, and they've made motions. There is a federal investigation of the investigators in this case. It's like the Department of Justice and the local U.S. attorney started investigating the people who investigated Karen Reed. And, and, and the defense has filed motions against the prosecution, motion to dismiss, now, WCVB in Boston obtained the state or the Commonwealth's response to the defense's motion to dismiss. Let's take a look at it. This is, this is the new development tonight, folks. Okay, again, this is where I want to start. There was about, what, 11 to 13 people in the house? Um, some of them were, you know, um, most of them knew John in some form or fashion. But the main players are, again, Brian Albert, Brian Higgins, and Colin Albert. Brian Albert, again, um, Boston police officer, a fellow Boston p police officer who worked with John, his nephew Colin, and Brian Higgins, an ATF agent who again, had an uh, entanglement, a romantic relationship, if you will, with Karen Reed, who is being charged and trialed for the murder of her boyfriend, John O'Keefe. Mr. Higgins, who's a, a, a fellow officer, Mr. Higgins described the evening of January 28th, 29th, as he was both at the Waterfall Bar and the 34 Fairview residence. Um, now, the 34 res residence, that's where... Uh, John O'Keefe was found dead on the lawn there, and the Waterfall Bar is where he and Karen had gone out drinking that night. Mr. Higgins indicated that he had met the victim and the defendant at the same time approximately one year prior. Hey, Mr. Higgins indicated two weeks prior to the victim's death, he went to the victim's residence for the New England Patriots playoff game. Okay. He stated... This is unbelievable. He stated he was walking toward the front door of the victim's home to exit when the defendant suggested that she walk him out through the downstairs garage. While walking through the garage, Mr. Higgins stated that the defendant, we're talking about Karen Reed, made an advance on him and surprised him with a kiss on the lips. Ooh. Salacious, isn't it? Extremely salacious. So now we have <laughs> claims that Brian Higgins, who is a witness, who was at the 34 Fairview residence of Brian Albert, who has a motive in this case for the third party culprit defense that. Karen Reed's defense team is telling everyone as of yesterday through court. So Brian Higgins, again, ATF agent has known and has been texting uh, Karen Reed. Karen Reed and John were having relationship issues at the time, specifically right before um, 2022, actually on Chris, uh, New Year's Eve. She was in Aruba. And she assumed John was kissing some woman and she went apeshit on her, which, hey, it happens sometimes, I guess, especially if you're already assuming or, or thinking, you know, while having issues in your relationship that you are 
uh, cheating and all that stuff. And I believe that there was a prior incident of that with John. It doesn't matter. Uh, the defense, uh, Commonwealth prosecutor trying to put that in as like character, um, witness evidence, like character testimony. And the defense was like, that's bullshit. That was, that was before that ever happened. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure the judge is going to put that into as evidence because it, you know, prior events do matter in cases such as this, but we don't know yet. So, so the point is that Brian Higgins, who left the residence to go to work at one thirty in the morning after being at the waterfall bar where Karen and John were drinking and hugging and smooching. We've all seen that video, right? If you haven't, let me know in the chat and I'll let, I'll play it. But, um, you know, they're smooching, having a good time. Brian Higgins is at the waterfall bar and then they get invited to go back to, you know, John and not necessarily Karen, but John gets invited back to the home by Jen McCabe, who is the sister of, uh, Brian Albert's wife, you know, the home where John was found. And they had known each other for a while, Jim McCabe. She's the one that Googled how long to die in the cold at 2.47 in the morning. Not suspicious at all. However, they would have never known that because the investigation, they never looked into these people. That's where Turtle Boy comes in, right? We all know this, blah, 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 blah. So this has been the, that, that right there was the start of the, <laughs> the locals kind of fighting each other on this and turtle boy getting involved and all of that stuff that that shit being exposed well the tables have turned so hardcore <laughs> because again the fbi is investigating the investigation right of john o'keefe and michael proctor who was the lead state trooper has done some fuck shit go out there and you can look for yourself right um, I've kind of summarized it on the channel before, but so now we have this man named Brian Higgins, ATF agent who just got back from a funeral that day, then goes and drinks, right? I think, was it Brian Albert that he went to the funeral with? I'm pretty sure. Comes back, goes to the waterfall, sees this, texts Karen Reed something very specific that you'll hear in a minute. That you'll go, oh shit, you, you, you'll get it in just a second. But, you know, they've been texting and then she sees John or, or Brian Higgins sees uh, John and Karen smooching away at the bar like nothing is wrong. I'm pretty sure after a funeral, first of all, you're pretty upset. You need a drink. You go to the bar. There's fireball shots going around. And we all know about that fireball. Do, 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 do. I don't want it in my life. I know that fireball can stay 50 feet away from my ass at all times. <laughs> and they should be with people like this who have anger problems and think that they're hot shit. So keep that in mind when we get to the third party culprit explanation that we're going to watch with court TV. Okay. Hey, Evil. Good to see you. Didn't uh, Karen Reed originally claim she never actually saw Correct. That's right. But she's positive that he did. You know, like, I, I think she's saying, you know, I didn't see him walk through that door, but I'm, I'm, I was waiting for him and then left. And then there's Ryan Nagel, one of the witnesses brothers, who was supposed to pick up, um, her, his niece who called for a ride. He never saw John get hit by her car. The FBI is saying that Karen did not uh, hit John O'Keefe because John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with that. I mean, there's just so much. And I don't know why you wouldn't, as a judge, just, why would you discredit the FBI's investigation of that? It, this case should be thrown out immediately, in my opinion. It should be done. But it's not. And there's a reason for that. I think there's some special interest going on. Whoa! Whoa. Now, Brian Higgins also provided authorities with some text messages between him and Karen Reed. The text messages were romantic in nature, with the defendant and Mr. Higgins expressing a mutual liking for each other 
In the text, the defendant confirms their kiss and urges Mr. Higgins not to worry as she knows where the cameras are on the victim's house. The defendant, Karen Reed, then invites Mr. Higgins over to her home in Mansfield, an invitation Mr. Higgins stated he declined. When asked by Mr. Higgins if she was happy in her relationship with the victim, the defendant made a reference to the victim cheating on her during their recent trip to Aruba. Okay. All right. So, do you see where I'm getting at with the third-party culprit defense? Before this happened, before John O'Keefe was found on the lawn of fellow Boston police officers' home, uh, front yard in a snowbank, they're talking. They're having this relationship. Homeboy goes to work at 1.30 in the morning. Brian Higgins, after smooching on Karen, texting Karen, seeing them at the water bo- uh, waterfall bar before being invited back to the home, I don't see how anyone doesn't see this, right? And if you haven't followed the case in its entirety, you're not going to really know because it's so salacious. Some of this stuff is ridiculous sounding. But here is where I believe, uh, and obviously the defense believes once you hear what David Unetti says, you're going to get it. (laughs) Hi, Hellcat. Good to see you. This looks way worse for Karen Reed than Higgins as far as motive. She's a house mouse. Ah, uh-huh. you know, here's the thing. Karen Reed is not innocent of maybe stepping out a little bit or, uh, of her relationship. That's, that's for sure. Not a good look. But that doesn't mean, based on everything that we know, the FBI saying that her car could not have hit John with the injuries that he has, I don't see it. Now, if they wanted to charge her with some other type of charge where it's a conspiracy with Brian Higgins, maybe that's more understandable, I guess. I still don't think that she conspired with Brian Higgins. But what I am saying is, is that the charges that she has right now is not consistent with the evidence, in my opinion. But what does seem consistent is a motive, intent, and opportunity with Brian Higgins and maybe some friends. All right. So let's put some context and perspective on what this all means. So... This is the, the, the Commonwealth putting this, you know, putting this out there, putting this in front of the judge, in front of the court, in front of the public. Are they alleging that there is some motive now for Karen to murder John O'Keefe because things really aren't that great in their relationship? And would that be a reason why she would be angry, maybe a little drunk and a little angry, and that's why she would murder him? Is that what they're alleging here? I, I could see that argument, but I could see another argument. Right. Mr. Higgins was at the house that night. John O'Keefe, if he goes into the house, he's in the house with the guy who's texting back and forth with his girlfriend, kissed her on the lips. I mean, to me, that could be a potential reason for some tension and, and perhaps a confrontation in that home. Not to mention, he's an FT, uh, ATF agent. I don't know what kind of hands that he has uh, ha- availability of technology that his hands can get on in regards to this investigation and, and fucking it up. Because you will hear, if you haven't already, that video footage that would prove either corruption or validate Karen's um, whereabouts or whatever you, whichever you want to put it on. The video footage just poof, disappears. Especially when the police get a hold of it. All right. Hey, Val, good to see you, hon. Hey, Archangel. So, all of this, you know, the library footage that would have proven 
where Karen was headed, which direction, all of those things would have corroborated that. And her taillight, potentially, that nobody seems to have uh, photo evidence of because some fuckery, <laughs> some corruption, in my opinion, or just bad police investigation policies and procedures. All of these things that would help exonerate her are just gone. That's interesting. But it gets better. So what does this all mean? Other than this case just got a lot more complicated. Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, in my studio, the founder of Violona Law, former senior homicide prosecutor, Bernarda Villalona. Also with us, all the way out on the West Coast, far, far away, in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Brian Watkins, and in Stony Brook, New York, family law attorney and the lawyer representing the children of the accused Long Island serial killer, Vess Mifta. Bernarda, great to see you in studio. Uh, ladies first, uh, Bernarda, let me go to you. What is this? What does this mean, Mr. Higgins, Karen Reed, kiss on the lips in John O'Keefe's house? Does this, is this better for the prosecution? Is this better for the defense? What, what would a jury do with this information? Vinny, we're going to call this an entanglement. Obviously, Reed had a lot of extracurricular activities that we weren't aware of until the prosecution has put this out for the world to see. So I think it's better for the prosecution because usually you don't have to prove motive. But providing a motive to the jury gives them reason to probably infer that she is guilty. That she I wanted to bring up this really good point. Motive is not always necessarily um, something that you have to prove or offer to a jury. However, it helps because when you're thinking of why somebody did it, that's motive. And that's going to help you either convict or exonerate someone when you're sitting with a panel of you know, 12 people, 11 people to convict somebody for murder, right? So motive is, even though it's not necessary, it is important, especially if it's suggestive language um, with the prosecution when they're speaking on things and asking questions. So. Is it necessary? No. It does it help? Yes. So motive, it's really good to have. She is responsible You're for You're not concerned death. that Mr. Higgins and John O'Keefe could have, according to the defense, are in that house that night and, and, and something couldn't have, would, I mean, to me, that's a reason for a potential confrontation. But still, who has the biggest motive here? It's Miss Reed. She has the biggest motive. And aside from that, I think adding that piece of motive. A bunch of guys at <laughs> 3, 4 o'clock in the morning who've been drinking all night? No. Aha. Uh -huh. And so that's where the alcohol comes in that I said earlier. The biggest key factor, in my opinion, that influenced the death of John O'Keefe is alcohol. We all know what alcohol does. We all know that, especially when you're in a state of stress or, or whatever, sadness. It's a depressant. Alcohol depresses your system. And who knows what else these cops were on. I'm not insinuating that, that that's what the case was. But it also can make you wig the fuck out and maybe hurt somebody who is on your... Uh, who you think is your woman at that point. I don't think Karen Reed has the, what's the word? Motive, the biggest motive or the. Brian Higgins sounds more like the plausible party to harm and kill John O'Keefe because again, her SUV did not kill John per the FBI's investigation. They have professionals. I'm going to trust the FBI's words. So I, don't, I disagree with her. Look, she is the reason, I think, behind all of this. There's so many theories that can come out of this with putting Mr. Higgins in the mix. But I want to go back to 
the evidence that now we're aware of, of the DNA that we're aware oh, of, the, the we'll corroboration. Get, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> I want to talk about Mr. Higgins tonight. Uh, Brian Watkins, what, what does this mean? It means the prosecution is reaching, is grabbing for straws. They know that they needed a motive. Legally speaking, Bernard is right. You don't have to prove motive. But in reality, you got to prove motive. People want to say, why did this person do that for me to consider whether or not they really did it? And a motive right. that you have a bad relationship with your boyfriend, this isn't a husband. They don't have kids together. There's no life insurance policy. You can't get a life insurance policy on your boyfriend. So the motive is... I'm not happy in a boyfriend in a dating like relationship, so I'm going to kill him? That is weak. You are reaching. That tells me that you don't know what happened. And the other alternative motive of some Boston cops, some... I agree with his analysis, 100%. Heavy drinking Boston tough guy cops get into a confrontation and it goes a little too far and he ends up dying is really realistic. And I think the jury's going to hold on to that. Vess, who, who, who is this going to help more? This fa I mean, both sides obviously know all these facts. We're now learning them, but who, who is going to take this and run in front of a jury, right? In front of a jury of 12 ordinary citizens. Well, in my opinion, I think it's, it's going to help the defense by a mile because you never want to try a circumstantial case to begin with. But this case, as you said, you know, she has her own cheering section. So to me, this case is an absolute prosecutor's nightmare bar none. And, and what I think they're trying to do now is trying to get ahead of it because the last thing you want to do is for the defense to say, look, we have reasonable doubt. We have another perfectly plausible suspect with something to do with this and it's not our client. Uh, so I think this is, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, sometimes you stick your hand in the pig trough and you get splattered. This is that uh, for the mm -hmm. prosecution and the optics are billboards. The reality. The They've got billboards. Here. They've got mobile. That's hilarious to me. <laughs> so they got billboards, house long to die in cold, which is what Jen McCabe Googles at 2.47 a.m. And again, at six something in the morning, which I believe is to. They knew what happened. Those people knew or specific people that was at, in that home knew what happened to John O'Keefe. I don't this even have a billboard. Nightmare. I don't have a billboard for my I don't show. Have a billboard. Karen Reed, an accused right. cop killer, has so, got a billboard. She's the perfect uh, defense suspect with with a lot. Uh, you know, it, the, the tables have been completely reversed. It's the prosecution that's backpedaling. They're, hey, they're scrambling. And again, the op, you know, the, it's not reality. It's surreality. And so far, this case, as you said, it's it's a barn burner because uh, every every day it gets crazier, and every day the prosecution looks worse, in my opinion. All right, now, Bernardo, let's get back to what you said. I want to, I want to give you an opportunity, right? Because it's, it's important. This is the physical evidence, right? There's DNA on the fragments of this broken tail light. I think the defense is going to say it was planted there. I don't like that. I, I... So what he's talking about is there are three um, male DNA results on the broken tail light that was found here, there, and everywhere on different dates, nine different times, I believe. And one of the, the persons who found it was Chief Berkowitz, who is now retired. And he and Brian are buddies for life, homies for life, ride or die, if you will. Helped pay for his retirement party. So, again... ATF agent Brian Higgins smooching on Karen motive when seeing John O'Keefe at the bar and her smooching each other. He texts, um, well, like the fuck, what are you doing? Kissing on him. I thought we were, you know, just got back from her funeral, pissed off. Brian's like, oh, dude, she did you dirty. Let's invite him back. Let's 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 see what's going on. Let's invite him to the house. I, I don't think people plan evidence, but maybe in this case, maybe they did. Um, is that enough, though, with all these other things that are happening that this jury's going to hear about? Is the um, the the uh, is does this become a DNA case, a forensic case, or do you think these other issues will overshadow it? these allegations of this conspiracy. 
So obviously Karen is uh, going to search for John O'Keefe because he's not answering the phone. She's worried. You know, she left him a nasty voicemail. He never returned home. He's going to, she's going to go get her man. She's freaking out. And she had been drinking that night. She backs into John's car, cracks her taillight. This is before John was ever found. And then goes out searching for him and calls Miss Roberts. Um, I can't remember her first name, Carrie Roberts and a friend and Jim McCabe, the house long to die in cold Google searcher. All right. So the taillight was already cracked at this point. At five in the morning, I believe, five fifteen, something like that. It's first off, this conspiracy is gonna overshadow the case from beginning to end. I don't even know how they'll be able to select a jury in this case because these same people that are cheering on Miss Reed are the same people They're that are swimming jury in the pool. jury pool. They're in the jury pool. And think about it this way. Even if you select a jury, Vinny, those same jurors are going to be walking past those fans that are screaming for this woman to be let go. That's so interesting. what are we doing here? It, 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 and, and I've covered trials in this courthouse before. It's a very small, small courthouse, you know, one courtroom. It's the Sacco and Vanzetti courtroom. Yeah, it's very small. But what they did in the last trial I covered there, they had the jurors meet somewhere else and they brought them in the back way and they avoided everything. So I think that's Are they going to be deaf? Are they going? Are they so, of course, prosecution loves to throw down the tainting the jury pool, tainting the jury pool. Well, that is not the defense's problem. The Supreme Court has ruled on this before, I believe in 2015, don't quote me, that it is not the defense's problem in a sense of um, media and, it, and that influencing the jury pool. It is the due diligence of the jury, the jurors, to be honest with their questions when um, picking a jury. The prosecution's the one that are, that's bringing the charges. So you got to do the work. Right? Which means that you vet your jurors and make sure that they have not been influenced by outside means. That, sorry, that's just the way it is. But the prosecution loves to do that. But at the end of the day, the defendant needs the fair trial. <laughs> right? Which means... If you're going to bring charges on the defendant, you need to have an unbiased juror, uh, jury. So do your, do your work. And this is where the problem is, I think, like in the Chad and Lori Daybell case, right? It makes it kind of weird, especially on a high profile case. But this one's just, this one is even on another level because of the corruption claims, the third party culprit. Where everybody has their hand in the corrupt cookie jar, helping their brothers and sisters out. <clears throat> hey, Jeep girl, good to see you. Yes, one of the most craziest uh, cases I've ever seen. All right, so we're going to listen to the latest and greatest court hearing. We're going to skip through the mumbo jumbo. Okay, you're going to hear me probably cuss at or about the judge, Beverly Cano. She pisses me off, especially when she's baiting for the defense to tell, tell her who is the third party culprit. Tell me who it is. Well, first of all, they're not under any obligation to give you that. Under the law, it doesn't state it specifically. So back, back, give us 50 feet. But we'll go ahead and tell you, says Yanetti. <laughs> he goes, hold my beer. Sure, no problem. Give me just a sec.
Sorry, it's a little laggy today, like me. Suppress, but it was a motion to... Uh, Kamala said you, you know, told your witness... Court is in session. What are you handing me, Mr. Lally? You know, it's an email uh, from Mr. Yanetti on December 22nd uh, confirming that they uh, do not wish to have observation for testing in the hair sample of Bodhi. All right, so that was about a month after my order? Correct. All right. And the defendant's asking me to exclude this in part because of the late disclosure of the information. Yes. Sir. All right, so, uh, I'll hear from the defense on this and then I'll give you an opportunity to address it, Mr. Lally. All right. So we're going to listen to the beginning a little bit and then jump through. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd first like to address the timeline that Mr. Lally has just explained to the court. First of all, we were not made aware that we were allowed to test based on Bodhi's protocols and procedures until December 1st. We were given a letter saying it would cost $21,000 for our expert to sit in on that testing. We, we reviewed that letter. We told Lally that, Mr. Lally that it was most likely we were not going to have someone independently watch the testing because of the price. When was that? December 1st. When? December 1st? On December 1st. Okay. We confirmed that. So this is the hair that was found in the, on, on the December bumper. December 22nd. And I would note for the court that Bodhi did not receive the hair from the Commonwealth until January 11th. Okay. So there was no delay on our part. As the court knows, to date we have received no reports from the Commonwealth regarding Bodhi Technologies' analysis of the DNA. The Commonwealth has engaged in repeated and inexcusable delays regarding the testing of this particular item of evidence, which at this point is sanctionable. The hair has been in law enforcement custody for more than two years, Your Honor. Two years, this hair that they found on the bumper of Karen Reed's car. First of all, I would be surprised if there wasn't hair in or around that car somewhere they've been dating. And then you have the Commonwealth who sat on this uh, purported hair for two years and then decided to send that all off and then give the defense the runaround. On February 1st, 2022, Massachusetts State Police criminalist Maureen Hartnett purportedly recovered a hair from the bumper of Ms. Reed's vehicle. For a full year, the Commonwealth did nothing. Finally, on March 6, 2023, criminalist Maureen Hartnett got around for the first time. Sorry, criminalist department? Is that what you said? Criminalist Maureen Hartnett. Okay, yes. Got around to conducting a visual inspection of that hair for the very first time. By the way, on this March is 6, Karen Reed's brother she opined that it appeared and father. To be human. However, subsequent discovery produced by the Commonwealth revealed that she had failed her proficiency test in that precise subject matter only one month prior. Then, on August 25th, 2023, the Commonwealth submitted that hair to the Massachusetts State Police Lab for DNA testing, and it was forensically determined that no human DNA was detected. Almost six months later, the Commonwealth made their third attempt to find evidence establishing that the hair was somehow probative in this case. It is now four days before trial, and we were told that we're going to receive this on the day trial is set to begin. Pursuant to Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14C, Subdivisions 1 and 2, the court has the discretion to exclude evidence based on the Commonwealth's failure prior bad acts, prior bad acts evidence in this case that the Commonwealth seeks to admit and the crime charged here. So and let's hear what Lally said. Excluded. Okay, come on. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Four days before trial and still nothing. Yes, Your Honor. So this also relates to uh, Commonwealth's motion to eliminate number 20. Yes. Um, so in regard to that, Your Honor, this is uh, highly relevant evidence as it pertains to motive and as it pertains to the nature of the relationship between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, uh, which uh, goes to motive, it goes to absence of accident, goes to motive, uh, ad, excuse me, absence of mistake. Uh, and this is not a, um, as the defendant seems to uh, continuously try to pose it as, as some sort of temporary or isolated uh, incident. This isn't just <clears throat> the argument uh, or the yelling uh, of swears between uh, the defendant and uh, Ms. Sullivan in the lobby in Aruba. This then leads to an argument which uh, both children indicate in their statements uh, continued in. So that was the Aruba incident that I said about Karen Reed earlier. I guess I would start, Your Honor, by saying that um, in order for evidence to come in, 
It has to be elicited by a party. It has to be offered by a party. Um, you're being told that the Commonwealth does not intend to elicit this evidence and that the defense does not intend to elicit this evidence. So I guess the question that I would direct to the court is, do you intend to follow up with questions? I'm not questioning the jury. It's clear that it may be a response, a natural response by a witness that neither one of you intended to get as a reason for something. Right. That um, the defendant on the motion regarding the testing of the blood from the hospital for the alcohol levels. Okay, so this motion is to the defense wants the blood alcohol level test to be not entered into evidence because there's a lot of shit that really kind of doesn't matter. But the range that they say her blood alcohol level could have been is outrageous. Outrageous. The numbers don't make sense at all. And 0.29 blood alcohol concentration. That is a swing of more. Yeah, it's ridiculous. We'll, and we'll skip that. We have no objection. All right, thank you. As the court is well aware, is uh, there are essentially three or four different uh, selections, and they fall into different categories. They don't necessarily mean in the medical context uh, what they might mean in the legal context. Uh, so of her being in custody when she makes that statement. I certainly wouldn't be trying to. So the substance of these particular statements uh, is uh, the defendant, Ms. Reed, uh, continuously uh, is told by Sergeant now this Buchanan, is important. Uh, to essentially stop talking. He's advised her over Miranda and advised her to, to stop making statements. Uh, so this <clears throat> piece of shit, Lally, right here, who works for the district attorney's office, <laughs> he is stating that Karen Reed told a police officer while being arraigned when the federal grand jury indicted her for second degree murder. This was the second char charge. The first charge was upgraded from manslaughter to second degree murder. He is saying that she said that she hit him. So let's listen to that footage. Uh, and repeatedly states that to her during the course of her making statements. Uh, but the sum and substance uh, here in a uh, second. She says something to the effect of, you know, are you in on the joke? Uh, and then makes some sort of reference uh, to having witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert uh, essentially smash John O'Keefe's head into the taillight, indicating that that's how her taillight was broken. Um, doesn't make any sort of further statements about why she would then leave the scene after that occurred or anything like that. Uh, but these are, again, uh, different accounts uh, that have been made uh, in direct variance to prior statements that she made January 29th uh, to the troopers, to paramedics, to treating medical professionals, to Ms. Roberts, to Ms. McCabe, to uh, the niece of Mr. O'Keefe, to a whole other 2022 action, uh, if there's any prejudice to be suffered based on sort of when they arrested her, uh, even by the defendant, which is admissible. We'll see that fitted in just a second. We object. Your Honor, uh, we're in a situation now where uh, the Commonwealth arrested Ms. Reed twice when they didn't have to. Uh, I made the argument to you at arraignment uh, back in June of 2022 that after John O'Keefe was found dead on the lawn of Brian, Albert, uh, Al Brian Albert's home, um, I immediately got a letter out to the state police saying, I represent her. I will surrender her, no need to arrest her, just call me and I'll bring her in. They ignored that and they arrested her uh, to get her into custody, um, I would assert ultimately to make the arguments that Mr. Lally is making today. Uh, then, uh, astonishingly to me, uh, after the grand jury issued indictments, well, based on basically no new evidence, uh, they uh, upcharged her and once again did not contact me despite the fact that she was completely in compliance with the terms of her release and had made every court appearance. They arrested her again. Uh, and so again, I would assert to be in the position that there are, they are in today. Um, with regard to the case that they cited, Your Honor, uh, Hoffer does not stand for the proposition that they claim that it does. Uh, in fact, uh, the issue of uh, that defendant being taken into custody was stricken by the court. Uh, the uh, testimony in that case uh, that was allowed uh, or sanctioned by the SJC was uh, evidence that uh, the defendant had been living uh, with his uh, girlfriend but had unexplained absences, he didn't get along with her son, she was afraid of him, and that he associated with a, a, con a, a convict that made her uh, nervous. There was nothing about him being in custody that was admitted in that case. Um, to the extent that these statements are, or the court deems these statements to be relevant and admissible, um, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I do urge the court to watch the video. Yeah, I, I think we'll put it on the screen because I want to see how the jury would look at it. Okay, that's fine. So let's act like we're the jury for just a moment and let's play 
the footage. Let's do it. Because we're going to skip all of the courtroom lingo. It confuses viewers sometimes. All right, let's watch it. Good old Twitter or X. So listen to what is being said. Uh, again, again, the prosecutor says, you know, something to the effect of, are you in on the joke? Followed by, um, you know, Colin Albert and Brian, Albert and Brian Higgins all conspire basically by bashing John's head into the taillight. Uh, homicide and um, leaving the scene of a death. Okay? So those are the charges the grand jury. So the cop is telling her that she was indicted by the grand jury for secondary degree murder. And uh, I believe leaving the scene. So now you're being charged and will be arraigned in Superior Court, no, for County Superior Court in death. Okay? So bail doesn't apply anymore? Uh, typically, I, I'm not, so we don't set the bail. So typically, once murder comes into play, people are going to get bailed out. So it's not manslaughter anymore. No, Is that the difference? That's correct. It's a higher degree of taking a life. Okay, so those, that's the charges that you're being charged with now. And you were indicted by great jury. Okay, you're aware he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. She says, you're aware that he was beaten up, meaning John was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. Okay. Which is Colin is Brian's nephew. I mean, uh, we're all in on the same joke, right? My tail light was cracked and John was pulverized. My tail light was cracked and John's head was pulverized. Right? That is not the same as what D.A. Lally says. He says that she basically says that Colin and Brian bash his head into the taillight in a roundabout way. Today, grand jury. So he straight up lies. And that, that's what this is about. Uh, but I will suggest, Your Honor, that there are other ways to accomplish that, uh, you know, either to uh, have testimony about what it was or, failing that, uh, to have the audio of my client making whatever statements they seek to introduce without the video. Uh, an image of my client, uh, you know, in handcuffs at a police station is what this court uh, generally tries to... Next, uh about 48 hours ago. So we have not had an opportunity to confer with our expert about that particular issue. Okay. Um, however, just from sort of a cursory review, it does appear that its submission is improper. Um, as the Commonwealth acknowledges in its motion, in order for the court to allow a courtroom experiment or reenactment, there are very strict rules concerning that experiment. It has to replicate with exactitude the actual event so that it is fair and informative for the jury. Admit that that's improper. You know, what they did in this particular Mr. Lally uses the phrase anecdotal experience. That's the first time I've ever heard that in, in this context. I don't know what he means by that. But if what he means by that is bringing into court something that the expert has done or experienced or has experience with and then relating that back to his opinion or his, her, her conclusion, isn't that what he's suggesting Mr. Whiffen do with his in-court experiment? That sounds like an anecdotal experience. But that, that's just me. I think we have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and, and figure out what the experts are going to say. I, I don't know what anecdotal experience means. Uh, so, for those factors, because right now I have zero information. On right, this. I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my. Okay, point this is where. I, anyway. Sorry, this is where I wanted to talk about the third-party culprit defense. This is the most important, and we'll wrap it up. So the judge is like, basically, I want to know who you are referring to when it comes to third-party culprit. Obviously, I have been saying to you. Brian Higgins for show. But this is where I believe uh, Yannetti tells us more details. But I like how he addresses her. Love it. So Judge Canone, I think that's her name. She is upset at the fact that motions have not been entered 
in relation to third party culprit. And this is what David Yannetti says. Start with the third party culprit alone, not third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin, but third party culprit alone because of all those factors that I told you, as you well know, the case law is clear that I have to consider. And if I had to do it now, and you know I can do it pretrial, right? You know that I can, today I can just exclude it. I'm not inclined to do that, but I need to be able to make those decisions to, in, to weigh those Young factors. Young teens. Right now I have zero information on Right, those. I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist, who has uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies, has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and are not consistent with having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports, whereby FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case, and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, conf uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So, <laughs> if anybody hasn't seen the injuries of John O'Keefe, I do have it on my, my Twitter page, but if you're kind of grossed out about things like that, you might want to look away for about <clears throat> a minute. I won't do it very long. But I think it's for my viewers who have not followed the case, um, which most of them haven't, it's kind of important. When we think of somebody who got hit by a SUV, you're going to see, think of the Sam Smith um, case um, with the Murdoch trial, right? We've heard about Sam Smith. Um, those kind of injuries, right? You would, <laughs> but this, these are his injuries. And again, warning, I'm about to put up the autopsy photos. They're not horrific, but they're not great. Okay. So trigger warning. Two black eyes or two bruised eyes. A two inch gash in the back of his head. Defensive wounds that normally you would see if somebody is trying to fight you and you're trying to protect your head or protect yourself. Right. On his hands. <laughs> and then these lacerations, which look to me like very obvious dog scratches and bite marks. Because Brian Albert had a dog named Chloe, who has attacked people before in the home. So, of course, in my mind, I would think that, you know, the dog is reacting to his owner getting into a fight with John and attacking John. They got into a fight. It's very obvious to me, to me, that these are due to a fight. That's just me. But being hit by a car... I don't see that. I don't see that at all. And dying from it? No. No. Nope. Sorry. Put that shit to bed because I just don't buy it. So therefore, if John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe, the Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think they're asking that you be prohibited from doing that. They're asking first to... Have you tell them what that is? Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of... Uh, right, so the, go, the, go ahead. You, have, you have your remarks. ...that we're either required to give them or not. Um, you know, it is not our job 
to solve this case that was for the Brian Higgins. It's our contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. Boom. The law states, if you go look it up, the criminal procedure, that you have to give motive, intent, and opportunity. Not who, but those three factors are what you have to when you put the motion in, you have to tell the judge so that the jury will hear these things. Now, of course, you're going to want that person's <laughs> or persons, right? It would make, it would kind of confirm your theory as a third party culprit defense. But he goes, we don't have to, but wait. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion, and as this court started the discussion on this issue when you first took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no Glad you made it home. of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, Given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, all three of these men, either alone or in combination, possess the ability to attack him with or without a weapon. I mean, it's a very low standard here. The Commonwealth acknowledges that. It's a low standard of simple relevance. And the evidence here establishes relevance. Now, I would note, Your Honor, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Finney. I don't know if they realize this, but that was my case. I represented Roland Douglas Philly before the Supreme <laughs> Judicial Court, and I represented him at his motion for new trial and at his retrial. And that case, the Finney case, provides strong support for the introduction of third-party culprit evidence. So, dumbass Lally, DA, he, he cites the case that Yanetti was on, and he did it incorrectly. So, Yanetti has to school him for a minute. Here... Um, irrespective of a Bowdoin defense. Um, in fact, the reason that Mr. Finney's conviction was overturned was that his trial counsel failed to pursue, pursue a third-party culprit defense. And, Your Honor, the third-party culprit defense in Finney was weaker, far weaker, than the third-party culprit defense we have here. The evidence of motive in that case was that the third-party culprit made derogatory statements about the victim after she was murdered. Specific evidence we have with regard to motive, opportunity, and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. All right, Something here's the important part, and then we're going to end the live. Uh, starting with Brian Higgins. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th to 29th. He was close friends with the homeowner, Brian Albert. He had a prior romantic interest in Karen Reed. He did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall, that bar, on January 28th. So think about that. Brian Higgins just got back from a, I'm sure, a very saddening um, event with the funeral. I'm sure he was not feeling his best, maybe a little down, needed to pick me up at the bar with his boy, Brian. He sees, then sees his I, I guess wannabe girlfriend, Karen, and John smooching, having a good time, like nothing is wrong. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves. But before he leaves, he texts Karen. And that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of. Whoa. So let's listen again. Th that kind of threw me off. Although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. 
At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves, but before he leaves, he texts Karen, and that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of M's. Uh, we know that there was a preservation order from this court, your predecessor. Look at the whole audience squirming it. <laughs> he texts her, um, well, like, are you going to explain what's going on? You're not going to talk to me, but you're with home, dude. Don't say hi or bye. Bet. Okay. That's what he's saying. But he says, um, well. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he was upset that she didn't even acknowledge him. To Judge Krupp to preserve his cell phone and that Trooper Proctor gave an, uh, him an edict um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton Police Station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the Riot Act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fairview. So, wow. He texts John, not Karen, but John, at 1220 a.m. Let's listen to that again. This is so important. Like, I think that this is, they nailed this um, motive. I do believe that this is what happened. And that Trooper Proctor gave an, uh, him an edict, um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton Police Station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the Riot Act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fair. Oh, yeah, he did. That is contradicted by this text message. And the inference is that he was coaxing John to come to that house. Uh-huh. And, you know, we're not... Brian Higgins texts John O'Keefe at 1220 to come over. I mean, I'm assuming that. Or text John something. Thing. This gives him a motive to kill John, but we don't have to show that. Uh, any motive to feel hostility or animosity towards John O'Keefe um, goes to his motive. And Your Honor, there it when is. Brian Higgins and Brian Albert are in that house, they're the only two people who are unaccounted for when the rest of the group was in the kitchen. And they claimed that they were looking at photographs together. And we have evidence that they were in the basement. We believe that Brian Apple Albert data. made a mistake before the state grand jury by testifying they went upstairs to look at photos. Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos and military ribbons, whatever they were Brian Higgins did not know that Brian Albert had said they went upstairs. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. Oh my. So there's the three levels of John's health data going up and down the stairs which you, you guys probably don't know this, but others do. He was inside that home. And somebody had his phone at one point in time. And it was going up and down, up and down. Because there was a fight. Now, I want to tell my audience that Brian Albert had his basement floors redone after this. Soon after this, he had already... Uh, replaced his basement floors prior to this. He had just got them re redone or remodeled. I want to say months before. I could be wrong. It could be longer, but relatively close. And then he got them done again after this. Huh? Why? What happened in that basement? What happened? I think that my viewers could probably figure it out. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th to 29th to look at photos. 
Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos, the military ribbons, whatever they were looking at. Brian Higgins uh, did not know. 12, 15, 12, 20, something like that. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. That means that if Brian Albert said they went upstairs, they're coming up from the basement. And before leaving 34 Fairview, Brian Higgins testified he was parked right in front of the mailbox. He would have had to have walked by where John O'Keefe's body was. His headlights when he got in his vehicle would have been illuminating where John O'Keefe's body would have been in the yard if it were actually there. So how does he not see it? He then goes back to the Canton Police Station at 1.30 in the morning after leaving 34 Fairview. He claimed to do some administrative work, but then he admitted to the federal grand jury that he was there to move his car because of the upcoming snowstorm. Uh -huh. This suggests that he was fabricating a reason for going back to Canton Police to establish an alibi for himself. Um, he, was he went to work at 1.30 in the morning after drinking, a funeral first of all, drinking, and then allegedly, Fighting John. He was asked several times at the federal grand jury if he had any conversations with anyone before he went to bed. Uh, and when was he notified that John O'Keefe was dead? In the morning, he said. He testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever. But he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone call. Around the same, about uh, you know, five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in the cold, about eight minutes before Brian Law from the plow driver first drives by the house and sees no body at all. And the next morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. After right, the, I'm going to stop you for a minute. I think we need a break, Madam Court Reporter. Do you need a break? Can you go? How much longer do you think you have with this, Mr. Unetti? How many more pages or how long you think? Yeah, I've got about, uh, in terms of my. 1230 was the last movement of John O'Keefe's phone from my understanding. 25 meters, <clears throat> which is 83 feet, number of steps 36. So this is about the average, but anyway, for about a minute, 1232. 2, 12.32 a.m., 10 minutes after Brian Higgins calls. A recitation of the facts. Uh, I've done about a page and a half, and I've got three left. Madam Court Reporter, would you like to take a little break? It's hey, hot six here. I've been going nonstop. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. So Judge Canone goes, we need a break. Oh, shit, we need a break. He's right. You can tell. The judge is like, oh, man, because she has to make a ruling on this. She has to make a ruling on what he just said. He didn't have to give names, but he sure damn did. And he gave a very thorough explanation, in my opinion, as to what happened. Brian Higgins, ATF agent, entanglement with Karen, sees them at the waterfall Waterfall bar, wasn't expecting that after a long day at the funeral in New York with Brian, comes back to the home, coaxes uh, John into the home, they go to the basement, and that's where, in my opinion, John gets his ass beat, the dog attacks, and they throw him in the lawn in the cold, for him to die. Why do I think that? Because Jen McCabe, sister-in-law, says, not to Brian uh, Higgins, but to Brian Albert, Googles how long to die in the cold at 2.47 a.m. Makes me feel like they kept checking on him to see when he was going to die. Because they knew where he was. I bet two-something was when they put him out there. Because Lucky Loughran... Snowplower did not see John at 2.30 in the morning. But once he was gone, I bet you that was the time because 2.30 to 2.47, 15 minutes or so, right? Go time. It was go time. There was no other witnesses that needed to be thought of at that time. That's what I think. I think Yanetti nailed it. 
Brian Higgins, the one that I always thought had something to uh, do with this, was always like, ah, he just didn't want anything to do with the cover up. He just wanted to get out of Dodge. No. Why would you go into work at 1.30 in the morning as an ATF agent who had a office in Canton, P uh, the local PD? Why? The entanglement. He was jealous. He was upset. Hotheads, hothead cops. Colin Albert and John O'Keefe had issues. Threw beer cans. Colin threw beer cans in John's lawn. Went and sang. I don't remember the story, but something about they were seen in his front yard singing and pretty much being an asshole. John O'Keefe mentioned drug activity in their neighborhood. To you, Brian Albert. Motive was all over the damn place. And it just so happened that Karen seeing, being seen with John like that, everything just kind of came to a freaking boiling point. Right? Alcohol. Alcohol. When you're in power, you're jealous, you get, you're used to getting away with things and you're used to getting what you want and you don't. On top of drinking fireball, you're not going to make the best decisions. And I don't think, I don't think murder was on everybody's agenda, but that's how it ended. And the right people need to be charged, in my opinion. And Karen Reed is not one of them, in my opinion. I think Dev David Yanetti nailed it. I think without the tip from one of the private investigators... This would be slam dunked. Karen would have been uh, falsely accused, in my opinion, and jailed because the cops were running the show. And it's very obvious with the evidence and lack of evidence and lack of proce procedure. It's very, very easy. I have no doubt in my mind that Karen will be free. That's just my opinion. But it's very interesting when the third party culprit comes into play that is so hard to prove most days of the week. Okay. Um, I hope that whoever murdered John O'Keefe gets the charges that they deserve, but I'm not sure. I'm not so sure it's going to happen. We'll see. We'll see what the FBI investigation, uh, if there's anything left with that, we'll see what, what happens with it. But thank you guys for hanging out with me. I know my viewers don't typically watch this case or, or, or is invested in this case, but I appreciate you walking through this with me. Guys, have a great day. Enjoy your Sunday. And I will be going live um, either later tonight on something different uh, or tomorrow. So I'll see you then. Bye, everybody.